When you think about all the different types of people that there are in the world, what sort of people do you think there will be in heaven? Who are the people who will make it there? I'm sure as you think about that question, you, you've sort of got a few different categories. There are some people in a certain category who you think that there, are, there is just no chance that they will make it. The, the, the terrorists, the, the murderers, the abusers and uh, the violent gang leaders uh, and so on. You think, no, no, there's no hope for those people. Uh, there's other people who you think maybe they almost certainly will be. The people who are kind and good and full of love and grace and compassion. And then there's kind of a bit of a grey area in the middle where maybe you're not so certain. What about those on low incomes who cheat on their benefits? Uh, what about those people who are uh, gossips um, because they want the love and attention of the people around them? Perhaps it's a bit harder to pinpoint whether they will be in heaven. What about you? Will you make it to heaven? Are you good enough to be there? In today's passage, we find Jesus giving a criminal certain assurance that he will be in heaven. This criminal is one of those people that you would probably have put in that group who would never make it. Luke just describes him as a criminal. He doesn't give us a lot of detail. But Matthew in Matthew's Gospel, describes him as a robber. And in John's Gospel, he uses the same word to describe Barabbas. Well, we know what Barabbas had done. He was a murderer and an insurrectionist. He was a, a, a violent, riotous, murderous, thieving criminal. And so it's possible, uh, not certain, but possible and, and not unlikely, that this man that was crucified next to Jesus was one of the brothers in arms, if you like, with Barabbas. One of those violent, aggressive, murderous, thieving criminals. The people you would uh, certainly not expect to be in heaven. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. On the very same day that he is executed for his violent crimes, Jesus promises him that he will later that day be enjoying the bliss of heavenly paradise. Surely that has got to cause us to reassess our thinking, not just of who will be in heaven, but also how do we get there? How is it that this violent criminal was accepted into heaven? What caused him to qualify? What is it that will qualify you for heaven? There's three things that I want you to see about this criminal uh, that qualify him or that prepare him to receive this assurance from Jesus. The first is this, the criminal recognises his own wrongdoing. The criminal recognises his own wrongdoing. We've already heard that as Jesus was crucified, these two violent robbers were with him. One of them starts hurling abuse at Jesus. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults. Aren't you the Christ? He said. Save yourself and us. This criminal's sole concern is to be free. He's got himself in a mess, he's got himself in a pickle, and now he's facing the consequences of it. And he calls out to Jesus, if you can do anything, I'm interested. Save yourself and save me while you're at it but I don't expect you can, and so I'm not interested. And so the man hurls insults at Jesus. You know, there are so many in today's society that treat Jesus in exactly the same way. If you can help me out of this hurt, if you can give me deliverance from this mess that I've made, if you can fix this problem, or if you can grant me success in the future, then Jesus, you know, I'm all ears. But if you can't, or if I already presuppose that you can't, or if you don't deliver on what I demand, then I'm not interested. And you become the object of scorn and mockery. But then the second criminal has an entirely different response to Jesus. Look at verse 40. 
the other criminal rebuked the first criminal. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. His words there are really remarkable if you think about it. He says, we are punished justly. Just remember for a moment, this, this criminal is not suffering a custodial sentence. He's not in prison. He's suffering the death sentence. He's being executed. And his execution isn't done with a lethal dose of anaesthetic that puts him to sleep nice and gently. His execution is done through crucifixion. Just about the most horrific form of execution that mankind has ever invented. Uh, topped off with the, the shame of the public nature of it. And he says, we're getting what our deeds deserve. We're being punished justly. But more important than recognising that the justness of his execution he recognises that his wrongdoing isn't just against the government who he's been rebelling against. He recognises that his wrongdoing is against God. Verse 40, don't you fear God, he says. He turns to the other criminal in disbelief almost. You're at the, the very last moments of your life. You will be dead within a couple of hours. Why are you adding more judgment on yourself by insulting this man? You're already about to face the anger and the wrath and the justice of God in judgment. Why add further cause for judgment to it? Don't you fear God? Don't you realise who you are about to meet? Don't you realise the judgement that you are about to go through? This criminal recognises his own wrongdoing and he recognises that he will stand condemned before God. He realises that there's a greater judgement coming and even with it a greater punishment coming even than the crucifixion that he endures at that moment. I wonder what you make of yourself. Do you see your own wrongdoing? And would you call the judgment of God justice? Would you call it just punishment, even on your sin? You know, many people would accept their imperfection, let's say. We could give a list of uh, God's demands for our life, God's law, as it were. We could talk about what it uh, how sin uh, is lying or greed or covetousness or lust, uh, how our pride, our selfishness, our unbelief, our theft, our hatred, our anger, all contribute to our sinful actions and how they will all lead to judgment. And, and many people will, will look at that list and say, yeah, I, I've told a few lies. I've done a few wrong things here and there, but nobody's perfect, are they? Surely the good things that I've done will outweigh them. Surely those little things that I have done wrong, accepting that they are wrong, surely they're not so big that God won't be able to forgive me for them. God won't just be able to wipe them away, will he not? Consider this illustration. Imagine I'm invited to visit the Queen. And in order to get ready for the event, I buy myself a, a brand new suit, all nice and clean. I buy myself a brand new pair of shoes. I even go for new socks. Uh, I get a new tie and I have a shave on the morning as I'm going to go and see. I have, a, I have a full wash, I have a haircut and I'm spick and span. I'm gleaming. I'm ready to go and see the Queen. But on the way there, I step in some dog muck. It's stuck to my shoe. It stinks. You can see it. And... In my vanity, I've, I've got white shoes on and a white suit. Uh, and, and against this white suit, the white shirt, the white shoes, there's just this blob of dog muck on my shoes, stinking and smelling. Uh, it's only a little bit, and so I carry on. Uh, and I get to the palace gates, and uh, they look me over. Uh, they see my invitation. Uh, they, they hear what I've been invited for. And they say, well, what will they say? 
they'll say, you can't come in like that. You stink. And I'll say, come on, I've had my hair cut, I've had a wash, I've had a shave, I'm 99% clean, I'm ready. Of course, it's not good enough, is it? 99% clean, my left foot is okay, my legs are okay, my body's okay, my nice new suit is okay, but I've got that muck stuck to me. And unless I clean it off, and unless I get sorted, I, I won't be permitted. You know, the same is true with our sin, as we seek to approach a pure and holy God. Although our sins, you might consider them to be just a small portion of your life. Just one or two lies here and there. No worse than the next person. But why would God, who is infinitely good, who is only good, allow that wrongdoing into his presence? Why would he allow you into heaven unless you've first been cleaned and washed and fixed? You know, perhaps the most difficult obstacle to overcome for a person to be a Christian and therefore for a person to enter heaven. The most difficult obstacle to overcome is to realise that we have done wrong. And that we deserve judgement for that wrongdoing. That our offence is not just against those around us, but it's against a good and holy and just God. And until we recognise that problem with ourselves, the reason it's so dangerous is because we'll never, we'll never get it fixed. Nobody asks for a saviour unless they think they need saving. And until you see your own sin, you'll be unable to call on Christ. Do you see the way you have offended God? Do you see the way sin infects your own heart and influences almost every area of your life? The criminal recognised his own wrongdoing. But then the second thing to note is that the criminal recognises something of who Jesus is. It's quite hard really to understand uh, what was going through the criminal's mind and what led him to these conclusions. Perhaps it was that as he hung there, considering his own mortality and his own imminent death, he thinks about his own judgment that is to come. And then he looks across and he, he sees Jesus. And he sees the way Jesus acts so differently. He sees the way Jesus is speaking with compassion, even to the people there at the foot of the cross. He sees the way Jesus is praying for even the people who execute him. He sees the way Jesus reacts, well, really, in silence. He doesn't cry out. He doesn't fight back to what's happening to him. And he thinks, what will, what will Jesus be like at the judgment? Perhaps the evidence of that situation alone was enough to convince him that Jesus is God's chosen Messiah. Perhaps it was enough to, to convince him that if God were to judge Jesus, he would, he would not condemn him, but actually he would vindicate him. Perhaps also this criminal had had understanding from before that moment and understanding of the scriptures. He'd, he'd heard about the Messiah and his coming kingdom. Perhaps he'd listened to Jesus. Jesus, after all, had had large crowds following him throughout his ministry. We don't really know how the criminal came to understand what he does about Jesus. But in the end, he makes this request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 42. As this criminal hung dying... He knew that this was not going to be the end for Jesus. He believed in faith that Jesus had a kingdom to come. And that Jesus would be shown with power to be that king that the sign above his head ironically stated him to be the king of the Jews. And the criminal says, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. As the king, as the one with authority, please remember me with kindness, with mercy. I am willing to serve in your kingdom. That's really what he's implying with this statement. Allow me to be a subject of yours. 
Don't wipe me away with the rest of your enemies. Allow me to serve. Allow me to honour you. Bring me in as part of your kingdom. There are many people today who are interested in Jesus as a guide to life, as a moral teacher, as an interesting figure from history to study and to weigh up and to assess and to, to put him alongside many other influences and voices that help lead them through uh, the confusion of life. But this criminal recognises Jesus for who he is, the king. Not least the king of heaven, the king also of all creation, the king of you and of I. And he recognises that the only right response to him is therefore to bow in service. Jesus himself describes himself as, as even the, the door, the, the key to heaven. The resurrected Jesus will tell the church, I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is the one who has the power to lock us out of heaven or welcome us into heaven. He's the gatekeeper. He's the bouncer. He's the door himself, actually, in Jesus' own words. And to some, that, that metaphor is one of fear. It's like when they, they come to a venue and, and, and they see the bouncer there and they realise, oh, I've not got a ticket. And there's a bouncer on the door. I'm never going to get in. And to others, it's a metaphor of joy. Because they know that the gatekeeper is for them. The one who holds the keys is on their side. And as they approach, he won't turn them away, but he will welcome in. Do you recognise Jesus to be more than a mere teacher? To be more than just a guide to get you to the venue? Do you recognise him as the judge? As the one who will invite you in or else turn you away? Do you recognise him as your king? As the one to whom you must bow the knee? The criminal recognises his own wrongdoing. He recognises Jesus and is willing to serve him. And what is it that eventually prompts Jesus to invite, welcome this criminal into his kingdom? What is it that the criminal has to do? Well, he only, he only asks. Jesus doesn't invite this criminal in because of all the good deeds that he's done throughout his life. Jesus doesn't invite the criminal in because he's got a stellar reputation in the community. He doesn't invite him into heaven, into paradise, because of his church attendance, or of his love for his neighbour, or his charitable giving, or his knowledge of the scriptures, or anything of that sort. There was nothing that the thief had opportunity to do to earn his place in heaven. There was nothing that he could do to, to wipe out the wrongdoing that he'd done. The reason Jesus accepted him was because he asked. Because he depended upon Jesus' mercy and goodness. You know, the same is true for you as well. You might feel so undeserving of a place in heaven. You might feel that, yes, you recognise your sin, but surely... I'm only recognising my sin because I'm stuck in the consequence of it. And surely that disqualifies me from forgiveness. You might feel you've left it too late. You should have done it many years earlier. And now that you've left it, the time has passed. You're too old for this sort of thing. Perhaps you feel there's so much more work to do to prove yourself worthy before you can come to Christ or before you can be assured of his promise. Take a lesson from this thief on the cross. What could he do to earn his place? What did it matter that it was his execution for his violent crimes that had prompted him to consider his sin and turn to Jesus? None of it. He asked and Jesus welcomed him in. And some of you might hear that and think, well, that all sounds 
remarkably easy, remarkably simple. And if it is as simple as that, surely what I can do is I can just leave it till later. And I can live as I want now and, hey, I've got my fingers crossed and later on I'll just ask Jesus and everything will be hunky-dory. You ought to take a lesson from the other criminal, the first criminal. He had left it till his dying moments. He had Jesus there by his side. Was he persuaded to turn from his life of sin, even in his last moments? Even when he had nothing to lose by submitting to Christ and everything to gain? No, he carried on in the way that he'd always lived because he was unable to turn from it. And recognise as well that, that actually that first criminal did ask. Aren't you the Christ? He said, save yourself and save us. Save me, Jesus. What a good prayer to pray. Save me, Jesus. That's all we have to ask. That's what the first criminal asked for. Of course, everyone watching could see that he asked it in irony. It was full of mockery and insult, really. And the request wasn't genuine. Now, perhaps you've had a lifetime of convincing people through deceptive words. Perhaps you've become quite good at convincing those around you that you are repentant. And perhaps you've become quite good at convincing people of your certainty of being accepted by Jesus. When all the while, you're not that interested at all in him. When all the while, you're still living to serve yourself. When all the while, your only interest in Jesus is an interest of self-entitlement. He'll give me what I want, but otherwise it's me in charge and we'll live my way. You know, others in the church, those people that you've duped, you know, we can only look on the outward appearance. At some point, we've got to take each other by our word that we give. But Jesus is no fool. God looks at the heart. And he's able to see whether your request is coming from a place of genuine repentance, recognising your sin and turning from it. Or whether it's coming from a place like the first criminals was. A place of self-entitlement and pride. To those who are genuinely willing to bow the knee to him. And to ask to throw themselves on his mercy. Jesus says every time, welcome. He responds with the promise of eternal life. Who is it then that will be? in heaven well i think because of the grace the mercy the goodness of jesus there will be many many people who we least expected to be there people who have recognized their own sin people who have seen jesus to be the king the one to whom they must bow the judge and people who have swallowed their pride and asked for forgiveness, thrown themselves on his mercy. Will that group of people include you? That's the question I'm asking you today, and that's the question I hope you will consider for yourself.